All right. Okay. So today I want to show um, something that I have discovered uh, maybe three or four weeks ago, um, which is basically GraphQL. I, I, I knew that it, it, it exists for, for many months already. I tried it many months ago and I failed because I was too stupid to, uh, to use Relay. And then I ranted on, uh, on Twitter about it, why is it so difficult? And then everybody said, yo, why don't you just try Apollo uh, with GraphQL? And then a few weeks later, you know, I had some time and I tried again and suddenly it, it all came together and it worked pretty nicely. Um, and after learning about it two weeks ago, we are already having some components on, on our um, production website running in production. So, um, you know, um, I work for this online art gallery called The Artling and this uh, luxury marketplace called Luxlog. And basically, just two weeks ago, I learned about GraphQL and I'm like, okay, let's build a make an offer model here and build this thing in React.js and use GraphQL for the endpoint and Apollo on the front end. And this worked so well that we basically decided to migrate our entire API for uh, Luxlog away from Django REST framework so it's a classic REST API and towards um, GraphQL. Let's see if I can. So this is basically our current API, and this is only half of it. I, I was pretty bad at making sure that all my endpoints are actually documented. So uh, you would have to click into it. Sometimes um, these even crash if you are not logged in, um, or they load very long because they are loading 10,000 products <laughs> and it crashes the browser. Um, and then, you know, this is how you could see what kind of fields you can post and, and how the result looks like. So my current workflow is essentially, uh, I want to write, write some front end components and I'm asking myself, hmm, which endpoint do we have that gives me that data, right? And then I go on this, to this uh, website here and I try to find that endpoint. Um, sometimes it's not on here, so I have to open up uh, in Django my urls.py file and try to find the route in my URLs file and then go to the API view and then see what the view actually does. So it's a really painful process, which is partly my own fault because I'm not documenting my API correctly. Um, but it also kind of shows that even though Django REST framework is a fantastic framework, um, it's not easy enough, right? Uh, you as a developer, you can still fail. And um, GraphQL kind of, I think, solves that problem. Um, so. I will show two parts today, and I will show a lot of code. So um, if you want to try this at home, you can essentially go to this uh, repository on my GitHub account and simply follow the same, like all, it's like basically these are my slides here. You just follow this thing and you copy and paste all the code and hopefully it works. I mean, I will show that it works right now. So um, anyone should be encouraged to try this as well. Or, you know, you can just clone the repo. The repo already has the final state. So when you clone this and you run pip install for Python and yarn install for the front end part, you should have the, the final version up and running. And you can just start playing around with it and manipulating it. Okay? All right. So, um, so for those who have not used GraphQL before, I give a very quick intro. Um, so it's a query language for your API. So what does that mean? It means that we are writing queries like this. We are not calling API endpoints anymore. There is only one API endpoint, and that is your GraphQL API endpoint. Like with normal REST APIs, we have dozens, if not hundreds, of API endpoints, right? With GraphQL, there's only one. And we send uh, post requests to that endpoint, and the data of the requests are the simple text uh, queries like this, right? And the data that we get back looks exactly like the query that we have sent. So it's, I mean, you don't need to know anything about relational databases, about SQL, or this kind of stuff. It's pretty easy to understand for pretty much anyone how to access the data, right? Um, on the back end, um, you will then, you might have different data sources. You might have a MongoDB, you might have a PostgreSQL, you might pull some data from the Twitter and Facebook API, and you all wrap it um, in your GraphQL schema. So your user, uh, the developers that build the front end, they don't care where the data comes from. They just say, like, give me the user profile and the name, the first name, last name, email, and avatar picture. That's all I care about. Where it comes from, I don't care, right? Um, another good thing is that your, uh, if you use something like Relay or Apollo, it groups all your queries. You might have dozens of components, and they all have their own queries. 
uh, it groups them all together into one request and sends only one request to the server. The server does all the database fetching and sends one response back to the client. So uh, you save a lot of bandwidth, okay? Um, so the main task when uh, working with GraphQL is you have to describe how your database schema looks like, okay? So you will have, so this is the GraphQL schema. Um, and by defining this schema, by saying, in my application, there is something called character. There's something called planet, and so on. Um, when, you when you define this schema, there's this editor here, graphical, that has auto-completion. So because the schema is predefined, the editor can fetch the entire schema and know about it. And while you're typing, it auto-completes. It knows which endpoints exist. It knows um, what is the return value of each endpoint. It knows what fields are available for the user profile uh, object, for example. Um, maybe they show this here. You can even click here at docs. It shows all the endpoints that exist. If you click into an endpoint, it shows um, what is the return value and what fields are available on the return value. So API documentation, 100% done. Always up to date, right? You cannot fail as a developer forgetting to update your own documentation and then you stop using it and then you have to go back and read your, um, um, your ugly code, right? Okay, so that's basically the idea of GraphQL. Um, all right, so let's start totally from scratch, right? You want to, you know, build a GraphQL server on the back end using Django, and you want a React.js application on the front end using React.js and Apollo. So that's the, that's our goal for today. Um, and you know, I already prepared this because I don't want to download things. I don't know how fast the internet is here. So if you started a new Django project, you would create some folder on your on your machine. You would start a new virtual environment. Then you would run pip install Django, pytest, pytest Django, pytest coverage, and mixer. So I like to do stuff in a test-driven manner. Lots of people who already saw the other two talks that I gave about this asked me, how do you test it? So I'm trying to show this today as well. Um, and when you have Django installed, you can run on your terminal Django admin start project. And you give it a name. And I like to name it backend in this case. So you know when you, when you run um, Django admin start project backend, it would then create this backend folder here and put a few files inside, OK? Um, right. So it, should, it, look, it looks like this. Um, and when you created a new Django project, you first want to um, migrate the database so that all the tables that are built into Django um, will be created. And then you want to create a super user so that you can log into your own admin interface. You call an admin. Um, all right. And then you can run the development server. And if that worked, you should be able to go to localhost 8000 and you see this uh, default Django page that every empty Django project shows. Okay? Um, all right. So since we do stuff in a test-driven manner, um, I, I have a few patterns that I always use in all my projects. So um, we will need a test settings file. Um, basically, we are overriding some things from the Django settings. And we are saying we don't use whatever database uh, your Django installation is using. We want to use an in-memory SQLite database because it's much faster. And the test will be like 10 times faster than versus using uh, your Postgres, your real Postgres database, right? Same here for the password hashers. In your tests, you will usually create lots and lots of users. And usually in the beginning of each test, you have to create a user so you can attach it to your request and then call your views. Um, and uh, with the SH, SHA uh, password hashing, which is the, the one that you should use for your real, uh, real installation, it's a bit slower than just using the MD5 password hasher. And same here, if you have any models that have um, file uh, data, like images or files, file fields, um, you can use in-memory storage uh, so that these don't really get written to the disk. So you say I/O operations, tests get faster again, right? So this is a simple. Um, test setup for that's useful for pretty much any Django project. So I like to use not the built-in Django test um, runner. I like to use PyTest, and for this we will need a PyTest.ini file. We basically just tell PyTest where our test settings can be found, the file that I just created, 
and then uh, I like to have 100% test coverage in all my projects. So we also create a coverage RC file. Basically, this file only uh, is a list of files and folders that I don't care about, where I don't care about the coverage. You know the, the manage pi file, the wsgi.py file, they are, they are pre-generated by Django. I don't put any code in those files, so I don't want them to reduce my coverage because I'm not going to test these files. The coverage in those files will always be 0% and it reduces my overall coverage. And I want to have 100% coverage, so I add these exceptions here in the coverage RC file. Um, so at this point, hopefully, I should be able to run should be able to run high test. I don't have any tests, so uh, it doesn't generate a coverage report right now. Okay, so that, that's like you just created a new Django project, you set up your testing framework, now you are ready to you know get some real work done. So the first thing that I usually do is I create an app. So in Django, those, those people who, who haven't used Django before, um, you basically, so this folder here, backend, this is my entire Django application, right? But this other folder, which is also called backend, is kind of my project folder. This, this folder usually only has project-wide settings. We have the test settings in there, and we have the main URL file in there. So that's the file here, URL file which shows all the URLs that are available in my application right now. And all the real logic, all the, you know, um, the meat and bones of my application should be sliced down into small applications, right? There will be an application that deals with a product, one application that deals with user profiles, one application that deals with, I don't know, all kinds of things, maybe a uh, current, I just built one for most currency support. Uh, so I try to um, separate small tasks into small apps, right? So um, I just created an app. So you, you would you would do a Django admin start app and then you give them the app name. So that's just called a simple app. Um, the first thing that you do usually in your app is oh, okay wait uh, before I before I move on because I'm doing test version development I create a test folder and I turn this folder into a Python module and I put a test underscore models file in there. Um, and every time you add a new app to your Django project, you have to go into your Django settings file and put the name of the app into your install app settings. Otherwise, Django will not know that this folder is the Django app. It will ignore the models file inside and you know, it will, the application will not work properly. So with this preparation, we would be able to create our first model. So whenever we create a new app in Django, usually the first thing that we want to do is we want to describe what kind of database tables this application has. So let's say for today we build a little uh, Twitter-like application where people can type messages and then on the home view you have a long list of messages, right? So, and you can click into the messages. So, uh, so we will need a table called message. So in Django, you basically just create a class called message, which derives from models.model. And these are the fields, the, the columns of our database table. Okay, so uh, each message belongs to a user, each message can have some text and a creation data. All right? So it's a pretty simple database with three columns, uh, database table with three columns. Um, usually, I wouldn't do it this way. I would first write the test, but I think it's easier to understand when you see what we are trying to test first. A test could look, so for each file, for each file, like I have a models.py file here, I will also have a corresponding test underscore and then the file name. So later we will have a schema file and we will have test underscore schema. In most of my projects I will have a util file and I have test underscore util. For every file that I make, I have a test file, right? Um, and for every class and every function in all of my files, I'll write a test. So we have a message class here, so we will write a test message test. Um, so this stuff is basically boilerplate stuff that we need so that we can uh, write into our database because PyTest by default does not allow you to write into the database. Um, but when you when you import uh, PyTest and then you make it, you, you, you call this PyTest.mark DB, then you can write into your database. 
Um, Mixer is a very, very useful um, tool in the Django ecosystem that allows you to create test fixtures. Because usually, when, when you, you know, write tests, you need to make sure that your database has certain objects. There needs to be something in your database, and then you can run your test and see. Like, for example, wh when you want to test uh, if a view deletes an object, you need to create the object first, and then you can test if the deletion works. And then afterwards, you check if the object is still in the database or not, right? So I always use Mixer to create objects in my database. And Mixer basically has a very simple API. You call mixer.blend, and then the name of the app, and the name of the model that you want to create. And Mixer will basically um, fill random values into all fields. And this is the cool thing about Mixer. So um, it even understands if it's an email field, it will put random emails into that field. And um, if it's a name field, like first name, last name, it will actually put out of a dictionary of names, random names into that field. And a good thing is sometimes it even puts Unicode characters, like Chinese words, into, into text fields, which you never test. And often you have Unicode decode errors in your application, and you will only realize uh, after running your test suit for a few times, you will realize that there are some bugs in your code because Mixer was putting Unicode characters into your text field. So it's a really cool uh, project. So I just try to instantiate a message object and I check if it has a primary key greater than zero. That means it's in my database. If the object is not saved to the database, the primary key would be none. Okay? So this, this could be a possible simple test called to just test a Django model. I mean, there's nothing much to test anyway. The model doesn't have any functions. It's not doing much. Um, yeah, I just write this test essentially to get 100% code coverage. Okay? <coughs> so we have our model. And we also want to be able to use the Django admin um, to uh, fill in some messages into our database. So I register this model with the Django admin. And now, at this point, I can create an initial migration. So basically, I have created a new database table, right? Django has this feature here, make migrations, um, that will create the insert table statements uh, for me. So when I deploy this application, it will also update my database autom uh, immediately, automat automatically. Okay. So at this point, server is still running. I should be able to log into my admin, and I can see my messages table, and I can fill in uh, a few messages. Let's fill in two. So now we have two objects in our database. <coughs> okay, so far this is like a uh, super quick introduction into Django for those who have never used Django. Now it comes for those who have used Django before. Now it comes the exciting part. Let's uh, try to use Graphene Django. So Graphene is a pretty cool uh, Python app that allows you to write a GraphQL schema in Python by by writing Python classes. And Graphene Django uses Graphene to have some even more integrated uh, stuff so that you can use it super easily with Django. And it basically understands your models and creates the uh, graphene schema based on your model fields. Right? Uh, very similar for those who have used Django REST framework, very similar to writing serializers. For each model, you usually write a serializer so that all the fields on your model can be returned to your front end uh, as a JSON string. Right? OK, so you would have to do pip install graphene Django and Every time we want to use a new app in our Django project, we need to add that to our installs. Apps setting. Um, and Graphene needs one more setting. I shouldn't have closed that up. Um, it needs to know where is your main schema file. That's pretty similar to the urls.py file. There is one main urls file that imports all the other ones from your applications. And the same thing is true for Graphene. We will have one main schema file, uh, which is in backend slash backend. Let me just create the file already. Schema.py. OK. And the code in that file looks a little bit like this. So we say. This is our main schema. We, we have to read it from bottom to top, basically. This is our main schema variable. This is the variable that um, this setting is referring to. Right? In backend dot schema, the, so backend is the folder, schema is the file, and schema is the variable. And um, the schema has this queries class. Right now, 
I, I don't really have any real endpoints. So I just put, you have to put something here. You cannot do this. You cannot just have pass and do nothing in this, sorry, and do nothing in this class. So I put a dummy endpoint there. Essentially, we have now one API endpoint that's called dummy, and that always returns an empty string. It doesn't do much. So um, we will later, we will not need this anymore for now. I need this so that I can go on to the next file. Um, oh yeah, we will have to replace, uh, we will have to add two more endpoints to our URLs. So graphical is the editor that we will use during development. Probably in the real world, uh, if you deploy this, you would um, only hook up this endpoint when debug is true, for example. You might not want that anyone can go to yourdomain.com slash graphical and then start exploring your API. <laughs> um, and GQL is, um, is actually the same view, uh, but this is going to be used by our front end using Apollo. Um, yeah, so this comes with Django Graphene, these two endpoints. So at this point, everything worked. Let's see, server is still running. I should be able to go to this um, graphical endpoint. Yep. And thanks to the code completion, it already tells me that there is an endpoint called dummy. Whoops. So let's say I want to query dummy. And it always, re always returns null. Uh, because we haven't really implemented, we, we said the type of dummy is a string, but we haven't really uh, written a resolver function, so it's not really returning any string. It's currently just returning nothing, okay? We, so don't worry about this dummy endpoint. We will have more meaningful endpoints later. Um, okay, so I said that um, writing these schemas is very similar to writing serializers in Django REST framework. And so basically, what we have to do is, oh, in our simple app, we will also have a schema file. So, and we have to, for each model that we have, so we have a message model, right? We will create a message type. So for each model, we have to create a, a Django object type class. Um, and the syntax is always the same, like um, you have like class da -da -da, derived from Django object type, then class meta, and then you say uh, which model is it and what, and it's always interface graphene.node. Um, and then my app, so this is in my simple app folder, right? My app has its own subquery, okay? And here we say we want to have an endpoint that's called all messages and that returns a list of message type objects. Okay. And then usually when you write these endpoints, they always come in two pairs. One is the name and the type, and then there's a resolver function that has the same name, like all messages, but resolve underscore prepended to the, the name of the endpoint. Okay. And essentially, arcs is post parameters. If, uh, if your, if your uh, client wants to post some data to the endpoint, this will be hidden here in arcs. So in normal Django views, they would, this would be request.post, right? The data inside, the post data that's posted. Context is, in this case, in Graphene, is, is the Django request. I could actually, you know, call this request, and then everybody who knows Django knows how to use this. You have request.user is authenticated and all these things, or request.session and so on, okay? Um, I, just, I just leave this. Because the Graphene docs um, don't assume that you are using Django, and in their examples, it's called context, so I just kept using the same. Um, okay, so now we created a new endpoint, but this endpoint will, at this point, not be visible yet, because in our main schema file, we need to import it. So we do import simple app um, schema, and then we, so that we use multi-inheritance uh, here, simple app schema query. And now we don't use, we don't need the dummy anymore because now we have an actual endpoint, you know? So we have our subquery here, which is abstract type. So this query alone cannot be used. But when we combine it with a graphene object type, so using multi-class inheritance, now we have a query that can be used uh, for our graphene schema, all right? 
So basically in this file, every time we, we add a new app to our project, we will just keep importing the apps here and then we will keep adding, oh sorry, we will keep adding those uh, query classes to, to our main query class, okay? So at this point, we should be able to see the endpoint, all messages. And it also knows that it returns lots of messages. And messages have a field called ID, and they have the actual text called message. I can run this query, and I'm getting the two entries that are uh, already in the database. Okay. Um, and by the way, the docs are always up to date. It tells me what queries are available on messages. It tells me the return type of message, and it tells me these three fields are available on my return type. Um, okay, so we did this already. We tried the query. Um, okay, let's create one more endpoint. One endpoint that returns a single message, and not all messages at the same time. So this, 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 I will explain this later. That's not very well. So my, my endpoints always come in pairs, right? I have the name of the endpoint and the type, and I have the resolver function. I just keep adding them to this query here for this app. So now I'm saying um, the message endpoint is just one field of message type, and if you want to call it, you have to provide an ID of ID type. So this ID type is something that I don't fully understand. It has something to do with GraphQL and relate how they deal with IDs uh, to identify what's already in the cache and what not. Um, I, so I, I won't say anything more about it because I don't really understand how it works. Um, so you can already see here when I query all messages, they don't have the Django primary key, which is just one, two, three, right? They have this weird stuff here. This is like some hash value. If you unhash it, you get um, you get a tuple with message type, the name of our type, and the primary key. So it's like somehow encrypted, but the information is still there. Um, and the theme um, gives us function to turn this string string here back into a Django primary key or message type and primary key into one of these weird strings, okay? Um, so in my resolver function, I'm essentially, I know that the ID that I'm getting here will look like this, right? So first, I will use the from global ID function to turn that ID into this RID tuple, and the, the second item in the tuple is my actual primary key. So then I can use the Django, um, the usual way how you get data out of the database in Django, message, the object, the get, the object with primary key one. Okay? So when I update my schema like this, I have to see those editor. Now it, it has all messages and it has messages. And it also tells me that it requires one parameter ID. Um, okay. I need to copy and paste one of the IDs first. Now I have an endpoint where I can query one single item. Okay? So the final piece of the puzzle is we know how to read like list views, we know how to read detailed views. Now we want to know how to write into the database. In uh, GraphQL, this is called mutation. Okay, everything that changes data is called a mutation. Um, <coughs> and let me just add that to our schema. So, okay, we, we read that from bottom to top again. Similar to how we have uh, lots of queries, right? we have query all messages, we have query messages, we will have lots of mutations. So this mutation is going to be called create message, and it's of type create message mutation. So here it's different. We won't have resolver functions because mutations are a bit more complex than just uh, simple functions. We will have mutation classes. 
So how does the muta mutation class look like? It has to derive from graphene mutation, and it has to have this subclass input. So uh, obviously we want to create a message, so the user has to type in a message. So we need to get message as part of the post data, right? And the mutation can also have output. So, um, and this is tricky to wrap your mind around. When you are used to REST APIs, you know like, if I call this endpoint and I do a post request, right? This means the endpoint is supposed to write data to my database. If my form data is wrong, the endpoint will return uh, 400 status code and say this was a bad request. Form, there are some bad form values. With GraphQL, you don't have that anymore. Every request is a post request. Every response is a 200 response. And either GraphQL was able to give you the data that you asked for, or it wasn't able to give you the data that you asked for. So um, it's up to you how in your front end, how you, how you figure out if there were form errors, if the data that was requested, if you are even allowed to see it, and so on, okay? So I came up with this for now. Um, I will always, when I, when I have mutations, I will always return a status, which is just uh, it's like the usual HTTP, error, um, HTTP status codes, right? Uh, I will have form errors, which is supposed to be a JSON string of, um, of my fields and the corresponding errors. In the same way like Gen Django REST framework, if you call your serializer and the serializer is not valid, you can return the form errors of your serializer and on your front end you will have a dictionary with the field and uh, a list of errors for that field, right? So I will, I will just make sure that I design my form errors in the same way. And if the mutation was successful, I'm gonna return the newly created message. So I will, this is a graphene field of type message type, all right? And then for each mutation, you have the mutate function. So, and here you can do things like checking if the user is even allowed to do it, right? Um, so this is, I, I told you, args is the post data, context is the HTTP request. So we can check if context.user is authenticated. If the user is not authenticated, and this is the funny thing, we don't return HTTP values like in Django or in Django REST framework, right? We return an instance of this mutation class itself where the corresponding uh, return fields are set to some value. So uh, in this case, when the user is not authenticated, we will return the create message mutation and we will set the status to 403, which means forbidden. So that means there will be no form errors, there will be no message returned, and we won't have created anything in our database. We just returned 403. On the front end, it's up to you how to deal with that. You will probably redirect to the login view and ask the user to log in, right? <coughs> or if the user is already logged in, you will say that you are not allowed to do this action. Um, then we will probably do some kind of um, form validation. We will check if the message is empty, and if the message is empty, we create, uh, we return an instance of the mutation, and we will set status to 400, which means bad request, and we will return uh, a JSON uh, dictionary um, with our, where we say the message field had an error, and the error is please enter a message, okay? Uh, if everything is fine, we will use Django to create our message, and then uh, we return, once again, like always, we return an instance of this mutation, and the status will be 200, there will be no form errors, and the message will be set to the newly created object, okay? So basically, uh, if you are used to just writing normal Django views, this is your Django view. This is what you used to do in your Django view in the post part, right? Or the resolver functions. It's, used, it's what you used to do in the dispatch function or in the get function of your Django view. Or if you are used to uh, Django REST framework, this is what you used to do in your uh, API views and in your view sets and so on, okay? So this is where all your logic is. Uh, and it's just normal Django code, like you always used to write Django code. It's nothing special. Um, all right, so now we have this mutation. Uh, let's have a look at test because uh, it might not be super obvious how to test this. Oh yeah, I need to create a new file. That's schema.py. So just quickly, people ask me, how do I test this? And it couldn't be any easier. Um, oh wait, I forgot some imports. Um, from mixer.
Um, so our mutation does three things. Are you logged in? Did you provide a message? And then it creates the message. These are the three situations that can happen, right? So you would want to write tests for that. Um, so the first test would be, um, you have correct data. The message is there. You create a request using Django's request factory. You attach an anonymous user. You can import anonymous user from, uh, from Django to that request. And then you simply create an instance of your mutation. I mean, it's just a class, right? Uh, the create message mutation is just a class. You can create an instance of that class whenever you want. Um, so we have an instance here. And the mutate function is just a function. So you can just call that function on your instance. And we know that uh, the first thing is supposed to be um, oh wait, I don't understand. Oh, root. I don't even know what root is. So in my test, I simply I, I simply pass in none, and it still works. You know. <laughs> um, then the second parameter is supposed to be the post data. So we put in the data that we've constructed here. The third parameter is context slash request. So we put in our request here. And and then we just check if the um, the result that we get. So the result that we get is a dictionary with, which has these three fields, right? And if the user is not logged in, the field status is set to 403. So you can simply check for that in your test. You check if result status is 403, right? So the next text test will be, now we don't have anonymous user. We have a real user attached to our request. But we don't provide any data anymore, right? Now the status should be 400, and we should um, see if message is in the form errors JSON string, right? Uh, and finally, we will have the same logged in user, and we will call the mutate function passing in an actual message, and now the status code should be 200. And I should update my slides because there was a lot. <laughs> should return 200 if everything is correct. And we check. Um, if we got a message on, as a return value, a message instance, right, with a primary key, so it means it has been saved to the database. So this is how you could write a test for invitation. Simply instantiate the class and call the function. And the same is true for queries, right? You can instantiate this query and you can call the resolver function and simply test what you want to test. So testing couldn't be any easier. Um, okay, so we have the mutation in place. Now it w we need to hook it up in our main schema file, just like we hooked up our uh, queries. Okay, and at this point, whew, thank God it works. <laughs> uh, now the editor knows that there is a mutation, and it's called create message, and you have to provide a message. And it, okay, let's try it. Let's try an empty message, and we get. Status 400, form errors, please enter a message, right? Uh, if we provide an actual message, we know that, we expect that we will get back the message object. And the editor can go deeper and deeper. It knows that messages of type message type, which has ID and message. So I might just want to query that from my uh, return value. And I'm getting status 200, no form errors, and a new ID and a new message. And it has now actually been saved to our database. Like when you look back, or Django admin, there should be three messages now. Okay. So final thing, and then I think we can have a short break. Um, authentication. Everybody asks me, "Cool, this is so cool." But how do I do authentication? <laughs> so um, there is something uh, coming up, Django Graph Auth. Um, I haven't had the time to really look into the code of this repository. And it, it seems to be a little bit stale. Haven't, there wasn't any work recently. And they say it's based on Django REST auth. So I'm like, why don't I just use Django REST, REST auth then, right? So I, I kind of decided against this. There's also Python JWT, which is like uh, the Python implementation for doing JSON web token. You could probably write your own mutation you know, that accepts username and password and then looks it up in your database. If it's correct, then generates, uh, encodes a token like that and returns the token. But you know, I'm not really a cryptography expert and so on. I would probably write something that can be exploited, so I didn't have the balls to do that. 
there is Django Rest Framework JWT, which I know has you know a lot of uh, watchers and stars. Uh, recent development five days ago, uh, Django Rest Framework has a huge community. Most of the people are probably using Django Rest Framework JWT as well in their projects, so I felt more secure using this. Unfortunately, this is not using GraphQL. Okay, but I thought, okay. Then I have an API that has the GraphQL endpoint and three more endpoints for token management. Who cares? Four endpoints in total is still a super easy to understand API versus my current API with 300 endpoints, right? So I thought it's a good trade-off um, using something that's very well tested, um, but isn't using GraphQL, but it works, okay? So you would run pip install in REST framework, then REST framework, and REST framework, and REST headers, and then add these to, um, uh, to your settings. Right. Um, and then Django REST framework needs a bunch of settings that we will just add. Um, and for local development, we need to make sure that because uh, our backend, our frontend has different IPs, so it's like different origins, and usually the Google Chrome browser would prevent you from sending requests between the two. And then we need to add the course headers middleware to our middleware classes. All right, <coughs> and you know, thanks to Django REST framework JWT, we have a few new URLs that we can hook up in our main URLs file, which is essentially these three, and these are classic REST endpoints that most people will have in their classic REST APIs. Um, so these three APIs will help us to authenticate and get a token. Okay. Uh, okay, when we did this, we should be able to use curl. You know, our user is called admin password is test1234. The endpoint is called AP token auth. So hopefully, if this worked, we should be able to send a post request with our username and password, and we will get back a JSON web token that is now valid for five minutes. All right? Um, so this is the first part. Um, should we have a short break? I mean, there's still a lot of food there. Maybe we, you know, get some drinks and we do a five, ten minute break. Uh, you can ask me some questions over there, and then we, we just return here and get to the to the more difficult part, to the front end part. Okay. So thanks, thanks so far.